if we had a transfer function, we could look at these uh, either either the time constants of the denominator if we had a system that easily factored with real time constants, or uh, another way of, of kind of viewing the same idea was to extract the poles out of this, so S minus P1, S minus P2, etc. And we spent a bit of time firstly going through the idea of like if we can actually factor this into real systems or uh, systems with real time constants in series, what that behavior looks like, and we kind of associated that, that with these S-like slow step responses, right? And then we, then we generalized and we said, well, there's this relationship where <coughs> I can basically associate a kind of behavior with a couple of different kinds of poles. So I can associate this oscillatory stable behavior with a pole in the left-hand side of the plane. I can associate this kind of behavior, um, or let's call, let's say step responses. So that kind of stable response there. So this is what that's like, this is what that's like. And then these, these guys go like this and like this. So those were kind of the generalized dynamics that we pulled out of analyzing the poles. And these were denominator terms. And so you could say these roots of the denominator or these roots of the characteristic equation are associated with particular kinds of behavior. And we, we spoke about that at great length. And the right way in my mind to understand this is to understand this is what e to the st looks like for particular values of s. So if I, if I have a value of s, which is over there, we know that e to the st uh, just resembles a, uh, a, a constant. So, so then e is uh, e to the 0. And the step that's what the impulse response looks like, right? So the impulse response looks like this. And then these step responses look like the integral of those impulse responses. Is that making sense to everybody? Okay, so, so that's basically the interpretation of denominator dynamics. So you basically, either, either you reason through time constants or you reason through poles, and this is the way you reason through poles. Now, an important part of reasoning through poles is understanding that, um, and we don't really spend a lot of time doing this, but I want you to just understand that this is a, a thing that you can do, that you can, in general, write... Uh, systems like this, uh, fractional systems or rational systems, you can write them apart as sums of simpler rational functions through a process called partial fractions decomposition. Most of you have done this before, okay? And so we can, we can say that there's going to be some kind of A minus S minus P1 plus B over S minus P2, etc. There's going to be some kind of form where I can expand that large combined fraction into the sum of simpler fractions. But the key point is that the expanded uh, partial fractions will contain the same poles. And that's kind of the reasoning that we go through to say that every one of the poles contributes some of the behavior that we're seeing. So the behavior that we're seeing will, e will end up being a linear combination of all, the linear co of all the behavior that we associate with each of the poles. And so that's kind of the whole story if we just have a constant over some rational, some polynomial. Because we can always calculate the characteristic equation. And fundamentally, the characteristic equation is how the, the, the uh, or explains what the solution to the differential equations will look like. If you go all the way back to your differential equation subject and the method of undetermined coefficients, it's the roots of the characteristic equation that tell you which things to add together when I pose the uh, answer to a set of differential equations. So that's all great. But what if we have this other kind of G, 
where we also have terms above the line. And we call these things zeros. There's no new special behavior that arises from having zeros. There's no space on the, there's no e to the power of the zero that we have to consider in order to understand what this uh, behavior is going to be like. The easiest way to understand, for me, the easiest way to understand the effect of numerator dynamics is simply to understand this basic idea. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do like an example here, right? So let's say we've got s minus one over So let's say we've got something like that. I want you to understand that, and this is not, I want also you to understand that what I'm going to do in the next step is just algebra. It is not like a special control thing. It has nothing to do with the Laplace transform. It isn't magic or anything like that. I'm going to go through two steps. And I want you to understand that what I've done here is I've simply multiplied out the numerator. Okay, that's all I've done. I've then noticed that because those used to be on a common denominator, I can kind of identify that there is this uh, poles only function hiding inside of that numerator dynamics function, right? And then I'm going to make a very important observation, which is that multiplying by s is equivalent to taking the derivative of something. And Right there, mic drop, that's the whole story of numerator dynamics. If you want to predict what these responses are going to look like, the first thing you need to understand is what the response will look like for the function without the numerator dynamics, right? And then you will understand that the response for this new system will look like some combination. In this case, the original, uh, the function without dynamics will be going down and the function with s, will, I'll take the derivative of that, and that will be going in the up direction. So let's just think about what that response is actually going to look like. If I sketch this, this thing by itself has a response that does, it's a second order response, second order over damped response, right? So I can see that it's gonna look like that. If I take the derivative of that, what will that look like? So remember, I, I expect you to be able to really quickly be able to imagine what the derivative of a curve looks like. So let's just do this together. So that's the, so remember, that's the zero point, okay? It's a second order response, so it's got that second order or first order smoothness at the first, so it's got a continuous first derivative. Um, and it's starting at a zero derivative and it's ending at a zero derivative. And so what that, what that looks like in terms of its derivative will be a derivative that has kind of a sharp line, right? Why am I saying sharp? Because the derivative of something that's second order smooth is going to be first order smooth, right? Does that make sense to everybody? It's gonna be sharp, it's gonna then go up, and it's gonna rapidly increase, it's gonna start at zero, gonna rapidly increase. At that point we have a zero derivative, the derivative increases and then decreases to zero again. And so if I just was, so I'm sketching this out, it'll look, I mean, let's try and match that a bit. So it'll look like at that point, that inflection point is gonna be like the maximum and then it'll go down to zero. So this is what like the step response of G1 will, of G will look like and that's what the derivative of G will look like. And if we, if we now kind of put that in here, so in other words, this is the step response of SG prime, right? This is the step response of G prime. And so what does the combined step response look like? It's going to be mainly going down. Does that make sense? It's gonna mainly go down. Why am I saying it's mainly going down? Because I'm subtracting that step response, right? Does everybody see there's a minus over there? Okay, so, so this was for G prime, which has a one gain. And if I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna draw that combination, 
I'm going to, I'm going to effectively have to uh, start with this. Uh, I'm going to have to start with this and then subtract that. And so that tells me I'll see some initial upward movement followed by mainly long-term a downward movement. And so in my mind, that yields a sketch that looks a little bit like this. Okay? And magically, we automatically notice that this explains this phenomenon that is described as inverse response. In other words, initially the system goes up, but overall, it ends up going down. Obviously, with the gains flip, this is the same as going down initially and then up eventually. But the, the point is that the initial movement doesn't match the eventual movement. Um, is everybody following this reasoning here? And so, for me, that's the fastest way of kind of sketching out step responses for systems that have numerator dynamics. There's a separate question, which is, Okay, I'm hearing a lot of buzz. Are there questions? Is anybody not following what I'm saying here? That's the whole, that's the whole reasoning right there, right? If I knew how to sketch the system response for a system that didn't have numerator dynamics, this would allow me to kind of induce a sketch for the system with numerator dynamics. This holds exactly the same way for systems in series. You know, so if I, have a, if I had a higher order zero, or like more zeros, I would just have higher order derivatives. And you can basically run the same program, but just like getting the second derivative and the third derivative and so on. Um, at every step, though, it's the same. So if you can sketch the, 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 the step response and its first derivative and its second derivative, to sketch the step response of a second derivative, um, you just have to find the first derivative and then apply the same algorithm recursively. You just keep going. Are there any questions about this? That's all I have to say about numerator dynamics. Yes, you had a no question. Okay. No questions. Awesome. So, I mean, for me, that is the full explanation. The, the, uh, the only little piece, uh, you may be asking, like, how would this even happen? Like, how would this come about? Um, and the textbook has the, the kind of the textbook answer, which is that this can arise when I have two systems in series, and it can even just happen when I have two first order systems in series. Uh, oh, parallel, I mean. So if I have two systems in parallel like this, so I've just got two systems that are being added together, if, um, actually, let me just not add them, but subtract them. So if the one is going up, right, and I subtract another one going down, if the time constants are correct, in other words, if the, um, if the, if the wrong way around one is faster than the straight one, we'll see that initial behavior kind of dominating and then reverting to the overall behavior. And so this can arise. You can see the math works out. If you just add those two together, you'll get something with a second order denominator and a first order numerator just by applying like normal algebra rules for fractions, right? Um, and we can actually motivate uh, inverse response by this idea that there may be competing effects, one going up, initially and then like fading out or not, not having such a strong response and then the overall response having like a slow but large gain. So that's, and the exact parameters of that system is explored quite completely, I think, in the textbook. You, know, you can go and see the exact math, how that works out. But conceptually, these are the two things that I want you to know about inverse response. The first one, or that, that I want you to know about numerator dynamics, the first one is that you don't need any additional special theory to predict the responses of systems with numerator dynamics because of this thing that I've just explained, that you can multiply it out and then just reason through the derivatives. So there's no special new pole characteristics that come into this. The differential equations are exactly the same. Um, 
or the characteristics of the differential equations are the, are the same. And then the second part is how could I end up with numerator dynamics? And this, this happens when I add systems together. Because you can imagine if I just have lots of first order systems in series, I'll always just have like the super high order system below the line. But it'll always just be one above the line. Um, but obviously in a real plant, there could be competing effects being added together. And as soon as I start adding effects together, I end up with numerator dynamics. So the numerator dynamics kind of arises relatively naturally by just adding this kind of mass balance. When I say mass balance, I mean, remember, I've asked you to imagine that something like a first order system is like a tank, like a mass balance over a tank, right? Same thing with an energy balance over a system or something like that. Every simple balance gives rise to something like a first order response, right? But sometimes there's an energy balance and a mass balance in parallel. Sometimes there's two mass balances in parallel. Sometimes there's series in parallel that are combined and kind of the combination of all of those things gives, the, gives rise to all the dynamics that we see.